Hello, it's Philip Taylor speaking from Richmond Green Chambers in London. This morning I'm looking at a first-class book which has come to us from Oxford University Press. It's part of their Oxford Handbook series of publications. These are big publications. This one is on international organisations and it's been edited by a number of people. Jacob Katz-Coogan, Ian Hurd and Ian Johnston. Now, uh, there are obviously a lot of other people involved in this book. Elizabeth and I talked about the book, I'll show you it in a moment, and we gave it for our, our review title, International Organisations, a Multidisciplinary Analysis and Overview. That's what you're getting, very much the house style of OUP. It's a heavy book, it's a hardback. You can see there, there's the front cover, there is the spine, and then on the back you can see the very large number of people involved. Now inside, you've got, uh, in the inside dust cover, you've got a list of other titles in the series, and then you've got at the front the blurb about the book. Well, you haven't really taken much of the blurb. It's got a little bit about the, in the individual authors as well. I haven't taken much of the blurb on this occasion because we're giving a slightly different approach to it all. You've got a detailed index, which is at the back, by a page numbering. The book runs to 1,244 pages, so it's under 1,300 pages, you'll be relieved to hear. There is the um, index running quite a long way. And then after the index, there's a, there's a lot of stuff in the index. After the index, you've then got um, an appendix with primary instruments. You can see the detail again there. Statements, declarations, there's a huge amount of information in this book. At the front, it's a heavy book too, 1,200 odd pages. There is the front cover. And then after that, you've got a preface. It's always worth reading the preface to get some idea of what the editors are up to with the new, uh, with this new book. The creation and proliferation of international organisations, big area, effectiveness and adaptability, and so forth. And then you've got <coughs> institutional design. Rather a nice little phrase, that one. Then we get into the book itself. We've got uh, a number of um, points. We're just going to get to... That's the preface from the, the editors. Then you've got the content section there. Uh, various different parts. And for each chapter, you've got uh, a person who's one of the contributors named. The various parts all the way through, building up. It's a substantial work, this one. And you've got a total of... Um, <clears throat> nine parts and 55 chapters in total. That's right at the end of the contents section. Then you've got a list of figures which are included. Then you've got a list of tables which are also included. Then of course nice lots of cases by uh, International Court. Then you've got tables of various instruments which come into it. And then after that you've got a very useful set of abbreviations. It's quite a long set of abbreviations for this book but it's not surprising because there's a lot in it then you've got the detail on all the contributors alas i cannot go through all of the contributors because there are so many of them but there are very large number of names there and th that's why this is such an important handbook because it has brought together the wealth of information from a very very substantial number of leading commentators academic thinkers uh, across the globe then we have chapter one, International Organisations in World Politics. And that is obviously the names of the people are given. What you do have in addition to that, of course, is footnoting. You can see a little bit of footnoting right at the bottom of page one. And then it runs through. You've got quite a lot of footnoting again. You've got subheading and footnoting used. Now, having grappled with that book, because it's a heavy book, you get some idea of what it's about. So what do Elizabeth and I think of this? Well, like many other, another title in the distinguished Oxford Handbook series from OUP, this particular handbook uh, gives academics, scholars and lawyers an astoundingly diverse and extensive range of contemporary research on, in this case, international organisations. I think it'd be very relevant to anybody involved in international affairs, international law, of course, as well, and politics. Um, the book's three expert editors head a team of no less than 66 international contributors comprising academics and practitioners 
who together present a veritable treasure trove of up-to-the-minute analysis and commentary on IOs, as we're going to call them, international organisations, including the legal, political and practical issues with which they are concerned. This is the arena in which law and politics meet against the background of the inevitable tensions generated by the often uneasy relationship between international authority and the interests of nation states. Um, frankly, and I know that there are people who don't like this, but you've got to be a realist and realise that politics and law are inextricably linked. Because after all, the politics creates the laws, and that's really why we have to think about it. And we have to think about it, I think, I suggest, very much on a global, um, in a global way today, because of the way things are going. Remember, a very large number of countries throughout the world are not democratic democratically elected places. They are dictatorships, and it's worth bearing a lot of that in mind. As the editors point out, international organisations are involved in virtually every important question pertaining to public policy, including trade, uh, security, health, intellectual property, international finance, response to international terrorism, criminal justice, the environment, and much more. I think the environment in particular is one area where there's a lot of controversy. Individuals as well as countries are therefore affected by the politics and the machinery of international organisations. And again, I think that's an important factor to bear in mind. While the focus of the book is on intergovernmental organisations, an analytical eye is cast over non-governmental organisations, or NGOs as we'll call them. And in turn, their influence on IOs and the private sector and the various networks are also examined. I think that's important, but remember it's essentially public in terms of the sector involved, basically because of the money. We are reminded too of the history of intergovernmental organisations and their relentless proliferation since the end of World War II, during which time few have died, in other words, just built up like Topsy. As the editors remark, Quote, the sheer growth in numbers has caused some analysts to worry about institutional overload. And of course it will inevitably occur to some that the age of global governance has well and truly come upon us. That's the point I was making rather clumsily earlier on, and that is really where we are at the moment. And at some stage, it's going to be a long way down the road, we will have to get agreements on a whole range of things we don't have agreements on at the moment. The classic being the internet. Um, but getting agreement on anything internationally could be a bit of a problem. Let's be realistic about it. Um, in this handbook, then, of over 1,200 pages, it's a wealth of information and insight into the structure, function and ethos of any number of international organisations, covering things from the United Nations, the World Health Organisation, the World Trade Organisation, as well as smaller but nonetheless influential bodies. These are powerful organisations, so we've got to make, we have to take notice of them and understand how they work. They also, we pay for them, so it's, it's worth bearing that in mind too. International lawyers, we think especially, will find this overview of the various perspectives on the workings of international organisations immensely useful, especially when the focus turns to the speculative comments on the amount and degree of authority that they may or may not wield on the world stage. That, of course, is difficult to quantify to a certain extent, but you do see um, very substantial um, pressures that can sometimes be applied. The many contributors then to this title have certainly opened avenues for further comment and research into what has become a crucially important and complex area of study. It's not going to go away, and I think we're very lucky that OUP have produced this important book. The publication is, date is cited at 2016, and I'm recording this in 20, early 2017. There's the book again, front, spine, and the back. Um, basically, the back just has the uh, details. It's, it goes a little, few little bullet points, but has the details of the contributors. Opening it in the middle, sanctions. Oh, tw chapter 20. Very big politically at the moment, bearing in mind what uh, the Russians are up to. Mr Trump's views are so it could be very interesting to see the way things go you've got footnoting at the bottom it's very very well structured this book how United Nations sanctions work 
Well, very good. And the legal basis for UN sanctions. So we've got quite a lot of information here. We've got a lot of uh, footnoting again. But you see, they go through every single important political and factual uh, matter which is of relevance to our global policies as they stand in 2017. We are on the cusp of a very new era for doing all sorts of things. We've got the fourth industrial revolution upon all of us, digitization, very big changes, artificial intelligence for the 2020s, so it's all to play for. Thank you to OUP, thank you very much to every single contributor, huge amount of learning there, and it, these books make all of our lives a bit simpler. It's a great fun of knowledge too, so thank you very much to OUP for their handbooks. Bye-bye.